I'd like to call the hearing to order. I'd like to welcome our witnesses today, Director of National Intelligence, Dan Coates. Dan, it's good to see our former colleague here. Director of the Central Intelligence Agency, Mike Pompeo. Good to see you, Mike. Director of Defense Intelligence, General Vince Stewart. Director of National Security Agency, Admiral Mike Rogers. D Director of Geospatial Intelligence Agency, Robert Cardella. And Acting Director of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, Andrew McCabe. I thank all of you for being here this morning, especially to you, uh, Director McCabe, for filling in uh, on such short notice. Since 1995, this committee has met in an open forum to hear about and discuss the security threats facing the United States of America. I understand that many people tuned in today are hopeful will focus solely on the Russian investigation of their involvement in our elections. Let me disappoint everybody up front. While the committee certainly views Russian intervention in our elections as a significant threat, the purpose of today's hearing is to review and highlight the extent, to the extent possible the ranges of threats that we face as a nation. The national security threat picture has evolved significantly since 1995. What used to be a collection of mostly physical and state-based national security concerns has been replaced by something altogether different. Today, our traditional focus on countries like North Korea, Russia, and Iran is complicated by new challenges like strategic threats posed by non-state actors in the cyber arena and the danger of transnational terrorists who can use the Internet to inspire violence and fear in the homeland, all without leaving their safe havens in the Middle East. What has not changed, however, is the tireless dedication and patriotism of the women and men who make up the United States intelligence community, the very people represented by our witnesses this morning. One of the many reasons I find so, many, so much value in this hearing is that it provides the American public with some insight into the threats facing our country. But it also lets people know what's being done on their behalf to reduce those threats. I encourage all the witnesses today to not only address the threats to our nation, but to talk about what their organizations are doing to help secure this country to the decree they can in an unclassified setting. Director Coates, your written statement for the record represents the collective insight of the entire intelligence community. It is a lengthy and detailed account of what this country is facing. It is also evidence of why the substantial resources and investments this committee authorizes are in fact necessary. From the human tragedy of the refugee crisis in the Middle East to the risk that territorial ambitions will set off a, a regional conflict in the South China Sea, it's a complicated and challenging world. Director Pompeo, the Korean Peninsula is a point of particular concern to me and to many on this committee. I'd like your insights into what is behind North Korea's unprecedented level of nuclear and missile testing and how close they are to holding the U.S. mainland at risk of a nuclear attack. I'd also value your sense of how Tuesday's elections of a new president in South Korea is going to impact things for us on that peninsula. General Stewart, I'm sure you're aware of the reinvigorated policy discussions on Afghanistan. While we all respect that you can't offer your own recommendations on what that policy should be, I would very much value your assessments of the situation in Afghanistan today, including the state of governance in Kabul, the sustainability and proficiency of the Afghan National Security Forces, and whether Taliban reconciliation is a realistic objective. If the U.S. is ramping up in Afghanistan, we need to know the IC's views on what we're getting into. I also hope you'll share your assessments of the battlefield in Iraq and in Syria with us this morning. Your insights into conditions on the ground, including ongoing operations to dislodge ISIS from Mosul and sustainability of the Mosul Dam would be of great value to the members of this committee and to the public. Admiral Rogers, I've made a couple of references to cyber already, and that's for good reason. Of the many difficult challenges we're going to discuss this morning, 
Nothing worries me more than the threat of a well-planned, well-executed, wide-scale attack on the computer networks and systems that make America work. From banking and health care to military and critical infrastructure, the functionality of our modern society is dependent on computers. When the first line of the DNI's statement reads, and I quote, nearly all information, communications networks, and systems will be at risk for years, unquote, that alarms me. Admiral Rogers, I look forward to hearing from you on this line of assessments. Director Cardilla, as head of the NGA, you sit in the, at the nexus of innovation and in data collection and analysis. Given the complexity of the intelligence questions the IC is being confronted with and the global nature of our, our national security threats to this country, that this country faces, expectations of NGA are high. We know the IC can't be everywhere at once, but that's still kind of what we look to the NGA to do. I'd appreciate your sense of what NGA analytic strengths are today and what the role of commercial imagery is in NGA's future. Director McCabe, welcome to the table and into the fray. To the extent possible, I hope you'll discuss the Bureau's assessments of the terrorist threat within our borders. Your agents are often our last line of defense here at home, and I will say, continue to do outstanding work. We're fortunate to have six people with the experience and the dedication that we have today. I'll close there, but I'd like to highlight for my colleagues, the committee will be holding a classified hearing on worldwide threats this afternoon at 1.30. I will do everything I can to make sure that the questions that you ask in this open session are appropriate to the venue that we're in. Uh, I would ask you to think about that long and hard, and if there's a question to move to, move to a staffer uh, to ask them whether this is the appropriate area, and if you as our witnesses feel that there's something that uh, you can't sufficiently answer in an open setting, uh, that you will pause long enough to get my attention and, and I'll, we'll try to make sure that we move to the appropriate setting. With that, I turn to the Vice Chairman for any comments he might make. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for your leadership on this committee. And I also want to join in welcoming the witnesses. Um, it's good to see you all. But it is impossible to ignore that one of the leaders of the intelligence community is not here with us today. The president's firing of FBI Director Comey Tuesday night was a shocking development. The timing of Director Comey's dismissal to me and to many members on this committee on both sides of the aisle, is especially troubling. He was leading an active counterintelligence investigation into any links between the Trump campaign and the Russian government or its representatives. And whether there was any coordination between the campaign and Russia's efforts to interfere in our election. For many people, including myself, it's hard to avoid the conclusion that the president's decision to remove Director Comey was related to this investigation. And that, that is truly unacceptable. We were scheduled to hear, director, hear directly from Director Comey today in open session. We and the American people were supposed to hear straight from the individual responsible for the FBI investigation. We anticipated asking Director Comey a series of questions about his actions and the actions of the FBI in terms of looking into which Trump associates, if any, and some of their actions during the campaign as it relates to the Russians. However, President Trump's actions this week cost us an opportunity to get at the truth, at least for today. You may wonder a little bit um, how seriously I know the White House continues to dismiss this investigation. Uh, I point out simply for the record the front page of the New York Times, which shows a picture of clearly administration that doesn't take this investigation too seriously. It is important to restate the critical importance of protecting the independence and integrity of federal law enforcement. This is central to maintaining the confidence of the American people in principle that all Americans, no matter how powerful, are accountable before the law. The President's actions 
have the potential to undermine that confidence. And that should be deeply concerning, no matter which political party you belong to. This week's remarkable de developments make our committee's investigation into Russia's influence on the 2016 U.S. presidential election even more important. And while it is clear to me now more than ever that an independent special counsel must be, may, must be appointed, make no mistake, our committee will get to the bottom of what happened during the 2016 presidential election. And again, I want to compliment the chairman on his work in this effort. We will not be deterred from getting to the truth. These actions will do nothing to undermine our resolve to follow the evidence wherever it leads. We hope to speak to Mr. Comey, and we'll speak to anyone and everyone that has something to offer in this investigation. And Mr. McCabe, well, I didn't necessarily expect to see you here today. And we don't know how long you'll be acting FBI director. But while I will adhere to what the chairman has indicated in terms of the line of questioning, I will want to make sure my first question for you, even in this public setting, for, will be for you to assure the committee that if you come under any political influence from the White House or others to squash this investigation or impede it in any way, that you'll let the committee know. This investigation has had its ups and downs. And again, some, including myself, sometimes have been frustrated with the pace. We will no doubt face other challenges in the future. But ups and downs and bumps sometimes is how bipartisanship works. It's a constant struggle, but one worth making. And I'm proud of the way members of this committee from both sides of the aisle have conducted themselves in one of the most challenging political environments we've ever seen. At the same time, Chairman Burr and I have put this investigation on what we believe to be a solid bipartisan footing with the shared goal of getting the truth. In spite of the events of the last 24 hours, I intend to maintain our committee's focus on the investigation. Indeed, the recent actions only increase the burden of responsibility on all of us to ensure that we live up to this challenge and to uncover the truth wherever that leads. There is obviously consensus agree agreement among the U.S. intelligence community that Russia massively intervened with active measures in the 2016 presidential elections. Nor do I imagine that any member of this committee was surprised to see the exact same Russian playbook just being run during the French elections that just took place last weekend. And no one should forget, back in mid-2015, Director Coates, we had some of the folks in from the German services recently, that there was a hacking into the Germans' Bundestag. It's fair to say that Germans should anticipate seeing more cyber attacks directed against their elected officials with their upcoming national elections in September. In short, Russia's direct interference in democratic processes around the globe is a direct assault that we must work on together and is clearly one of the top worldwide threats. That being said, gentlemen, I want to start again by thanking you for your service to the nation. I want to particularly note that Director Coates, who is testifying before this committee in the first time since his confirmation. Dan, I know that you and uh, Marsha were ready for retirement, and I thank you both for being willing to serve your country one more time. I also want to recognize the men and women who you represent here today. These thousands of dedicated intelligence professionals toil in the shadows, put their lives on the line, and make sacrifices most of us will never know. In order to keep our country safe, I also want to make, sh them, I want to make sure they know that I appreciate their efforts and I'm proud to represent them, not only as the vice chair of the Intelligence Committee, but as a senator from Virginia, where so many of those intelligence professionals lead. This committee's annual worldwide threat hearing is an important opportunity to review the threats and challenges we face as a nation. Obviously, these threats continue to multiply. As the world becomes more complex and challenging, good intelligence gives our policymakers and national leaders a heads up on the challenges they need to address. The intelligence community, in many ways, is our nation's early warning system. However, a firearm alarm only works if you pay attention to it. You cannot ignore it simply because you do not like what it's telling you. Similarly, we need to make sure that all our policymakers pay attention to the warnings provided by you, the independent, nonpartisan intelligence professionals. Since the world, Second World War, America has relied, as we all know, on a global system of alliances, institutions, and norms to ensure our stability and prosperity. Today, many challenges threaten that system, that system that has been built up over the last 70 years. 
As the Chairman mentioned, countries like China and Russia are challenging many of the, the global institutions. They are, in many cases, seeking to undercut and de delegitimize them. We must work together to stand vigilant against that threat. Similarly, rogue states, such as North Korea, have sought to undercut the global nonproliferation regime. Obviously, North Korea is one of the most pressing issues our country faces. And Admiral Rogers, as the Chairman mentioned, we all share enormous concern about both the upside and downside of new technologies and the asymmetrical threats that are posed by cyber and other technology actors. And I would add as well, Director Cardillo, I think we've discussed as well, our dominance in terms of overhead in many ways is at threat as well from emerging nations. Terrorist groups and extremists are also able to access a lot of these new technologies. And while ISIS in particular continues to suffer losses in Syria, Iraq, and Libya, unfortunately it continues to spread its hateful ideology through social media and encrypted communications. Gentlemen, I've only lightly touched on a few of the challenges we face. I look forward to the discussion we're about to have. But again, I thank you for being here and look forward to this hearing. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank the Vice Chairman uh, for members' purposes. We have a vote scheduled on the floor at 11 o'clock. It's the intent of the Chair and Vice Chair that we will rotate the gavel so that the hearing continues through. Uh, members will be recognized by seniority for five minutes. Uh, when we conclude the open session, hopefully in, with enough uh, gap for our witnesses to have some lunch, uh, we will reconvene at 1.30. The afternoon vote to my knowledge, is not set yet, but we will work uh, around that. So um, plan to be back at the uh, uh, SCIF by 1.30 for that hearing to start. With that, Director Coates, the floor is yours. Chairman Burr, uh, Vice Chairman Warner, members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today. I'm here with my colleagues from across the IC community, and I'm sure I speak for my colleague, Mike Pompeo, new director of the CIA, that the two of us, new to the job, have inherited an intelligence community with leadership and professionals with expertise um, that is exceptional. Uh, and it is uh, a great privilege uh, to hold these positions and know that we have the support from across 17 agencies relative to gathering intelligence, analyzing and synthesizing that intelligence. And several of those leaders are sitting here today and we're most appreciative of their contributions uh, to their country and to this issue. The complexity of the threat environment is ever expanding and has challenged the IC to stay ahead of the adversary and it has not been an easy task. Given the tests we face around the world, the IC continues its work to collect, to analyze, and integrate these and other issues. We appreciate very much the support from your committee to address these threats in a way that will give the President, the Congress, and other policymakers the best and most integrated intelligence we can assemble. In the interest of time and on behalf of my colleagues at the table, I'll discuss just some of the many challenging threats that we currently face. The intelligence community's written statement for the record that was submitted earlier discusses these and many other threats in greater detail. Let me start with North Korea. North Korea is an increasingly grave national security threat to the United States because of its growing missile and nuclear capabilities combined with the aggressive approach of its leader, Kim Jong-un. Kim is attempting to prove he has the cap capability to strike the U.S. mainland with a nuclear weapon. He has taken initial steps toward fielding a mobile, a mobile intercontinental ballistic missile, but it has not yet been flight tested. North Korea updated its constitution in 2012 to declare itself a nuclear power, and its officials consistently state nuclear weapons are the basis for regime survival suggesting Kim does not intend, not intend to negotiate them away. Although intelligence collection on North Korea poses difficulties given North Korea's isolation, the IC will continue to dedicate resources to this key challenge. 
It requires some of our most talented professionals to warn our leaders of impending North Korean actions and of the long-term implications of their strategic weapons programs. In Syria, we assess that the regime will maintain its momentum on the battlefield, provided, as is likely, that it maintains support from Iran and Russia. The continuation of the Syrian conflict will worsen already disastrous conditions for Syrians and regional states. Furthermore, on April 4th, the Syrian regime used the nerve agent Sarin against the opposition in Khan Sheikhoun in what is probably the largest chemical attack by the regime since August 2013. The Syrian regime probably used chemical weapons in the response to battlefield losses along the Hama battlefront in late March that threatened key infrastructure. We assess that Syria is probably both willing and able to use CW, chemical warfare, in future attacks, but we do not know if they plan to do so. We are still acquiring and continuing to analyze all intelligence related to the question of whether Russian officials had foreknowledge of the Syrian CW attack on 4 April. And as we learn this information, we will certainly share it with this committee. Cyber threats continue to represent a critical national security issue for the United States for two key reasons. First, our adversaries are becoming bolder, more capable, and more adept at using cyberspace to threaten our interest and shape real-world outcomes. And the number of adversaries grows as nation-states, terrorist groups, criminal organizations, and others continue to develop cyber capabilities. Secondly, the potential impact of these cyber threats is amplified by the ongoing integration of technology into our critical infrastructure and into our daily lives. Our relationships and businesses already rely on our critical, on, on social media and communication technologies and on critical infrastructure. It, it is becoming increasingly reliant on the internet. As such, this raises the potential for physical, economic, and psychological consequences when a cyber attack or exploitation event occurs. The worldwide threat of terrorism is geographically diverse and multifaceted, and it poses a continuing challenge for the United States, for our allies and partners who seek to counter it. ISIS is experiencing territorial losses in Iraq and Syria, with persistent counterterrorism operations degrading its strength. However, ISIS will continue to be an active terrorist threat to the United States due to its proven ability to direct and inspire attacks against a wide range of targets around the world. <coughs> Outside Iraq and Syria, ISIS is seeking to foster interconnectedness among its global branches and networks, align their efforts to its strategy, and withstand counter-ISIS efforts. We assess that ISIS maintains the intent and capability to direct, enable, assist, and inspire transnational attacks. Al-Qaeda and its affiliates continue to pose a significant terrorist threat overseas as they remain primarily focused on local and regional conflicts. And homegrown violent extremists remain the most frequent and unpredictable terrorist threat to the United States homeland. This threat will persist with many attacks happening with little or no warning. In Turkey, tensions in Turkey might escalate rapidly and unpredictably in 2017 as the government's consolidation of power, crackdowns on dissent, and restrictions on free media continue. Let me now take just a quick run through some key areas of the Middle East. In Iraq, Baghdad's primary focus through 2017 will be recapturing and stabilizing Mosul and other territory controlled by ISIS. ISIS in Iraq is preparing to regroup, however, and continue an insurgency and terrorist campaign even as it loses territory. We assess that Iraq will still face serious challenges to its stability, political viability, and territorial integrity, even as the threat from ISIS is reduced. Reconstruction will cost billions of dollars, and ethno-sectarian and political reconciliation will be an enduring challenge. In Iran, 
Tehran's public statements suggest that it wants to preserve the joint comprehensive plan of action because it views the deal as a means to remove sanctions while preserving some nuclear capabilities. Iran's implementation of the deal has extended the amount of time Iran would need to produce enough fissile material for a nuclear weapon from a few months to about a year. Tehran's malignant activities, however, continue. For example, Iran provides arms, financing, and training, and manages as many as 10,000 Iraqi, Afghan, and Pakistani Shia fighters in Syria to support the Assad regime. Iran has sent hundreds of its own forces to include members of the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps and the IRGC Quds Force to Syria as advisors. In Yemen, fighting, we assess, fighting will almost certainly persist in 2017 between Houthi-aligned forces trained by Iran and the Yemeni government backed by a Saudi-led coalition. Neither side has been able to achieve decisive results through military force to this point. Al-Qaeda in the Arabian, Arabian Peninsula and ISIS branch in Yemen have exploited the conflict and the collapse of government authority to gain new recruits and allies and expand their influence. In South Asia, the intelligence community assesses that the political and security situation in Afghanistan will almost certainly deteriorate through 2018, even with a modest increase in military assistance by the United States and its partners. This deterioration is undermined by its dire economic situation. Afghanistan will struggle to curb its dependence on external support until it contains the insurgency or reaches a peace agreement with the Taliban. Meanwhile, we assess that the Taliban is likely to continue to make gains, especially in rural areas. Afghan security forces' performance will probably worsen due to a combination of Taliban operations, combat casualties, desertions, poor logistics support, and weak leadership. Pakistan is concerned about international isolation and sees its position through the prism of India's rising international status, including India's expanded foreign outreach and deepening ties to the United States. Pakistan will likely turn to China to offset its isolation, empowering a relationship that will help Beijing to project influence into the Indian Ocean. In addition, Islamabad has failed to curb militants and terrorists in Pakistan. These groups will present a sustained threat to the United States' interests in the region and continue to plan and conduct attacks in India and Afghanistan. Pakistan is also expanding its nuclear arsenal and pursuing tactical nuclear weapons, potentially lowering the threshold for their use. Let me now turn to Russia. We assess that Russia is likely to be more aggressive in foreign and global affairs, more unpredictable in its approach to the United States, and more authoritarian in, authoritarian in its approach to domestic policies and politics. We assess that Russia will continue to look to leverage its military support to the Assad regime to drive a political settlement process in Syria on their terms. Moscow is also likely to use Russia's military intervention in Syria in conjunction with efforts to capitalize on fears of a growing ISIS and extremist threat to expand its role in the Middle East. We assess that Moscow's strategic objectives in Ukraine, maintaining long-term influence over Kiev and frustrating Ukraine's attempts to integrate into Western institutions, will remain unchanged in 2017. Russia's military intervention in eastern Ukraine contains more than two years continues, excuse me, more than two years after the Minsk II agreement. Russia continues to exert military and diplomatic pressure to coerce Ukraine into implementing Moscow's interpretation of the political provisions of the Minsk agreement, among them constitutional amendments that would effectively give Moscow a veto over Kiev's strategic decisions. In China, China will continue, we assess, to pursue an active foreign policy, especially within the Asia-Pacific region, highlighted by a firm stance on competing territorial claims in the East China Sea and South China Sea, relations with Taiwan, and its pursuit of economic engagement across East Asia. 
China views a strong military as a critical element in advancing its interests. It will also pursue efforts aimed at fulfilling its ambitious One Belt, One Road initiative to expand their strategic influence and economic role across Asia through infrastructure projects. Just a quick look at Sub-Saharan Africa, home to more than a billion people and expected to double in size by mid-century. Af African governments face the threat of coups, popular uprisings, widespread violence, and terrorist attacks, including from Al-Qaeda and its ISIS affiliates. In the Western Hemisphere, Venezuela's unpopular autocratic government will turn to increasingly repressive means to contain political opponents and street unrest. Oil has long been the regime's cash cow, but mismanagement has led to declining output and revenue. We assess the Venezuelan government will struggle to contain inflation, make debt payments, and pay for imports of scarce basic goods and medicines. Mexico's government will focus on domestic priorities to prepare for the 2018 presidential election while seeking to limit fallout from strained relations with the United States. Public demand for government action against crime and corruption will add to political pressure. As Cuba heads into the final year of preparations for a historic transition to a next generation leader in early 2018, the government's focus will be on preserving control while managing recession. Cuba, which continues to use repressive measures to stifle human rights and constrain democracy activists, blames its slowing economy on lower global commodity prices, the U.S. embargo, and the economic crisis in Venezuela a key benefactor. Let me just state, make a statement on the threat from the illegal drugs. The threat to the United States from foreign produced drugs, especially heroin, synthetic opioids, meth, and cocaine, have grown significantly in the past few years. This is contributing to previously unseen levels of U.S. drug-related mortality, which now exceeds all other U.S. causes of injurious death. Finally, I'd like to make a few points here that are important to the IC going forward. As you are all very aware, Section 702 of the FISA Amendments Act is due to expire at the end of the year. I cannot stress enough the importance of this authority in how the IC does its work to keep Americans safe, and I know that is shared by everyone at this table. Section 702 is an extremely effective tool to protect our nation from terrorists and other threats. As I described in my confirmation hearing, 702 is instrumental to so much of the IC's critical work in protecting the American people from threats from abroad. The intelligence community is committed to working with all of you in both classified and unclassified sessions to ensure that you understand not only how we use our authorities, but also how we protect privacy and civil liberties in the process. Additionally, many of you have asked me as part of my confirmation process about the status of the IC, its effectiveness and efficiency, and how it can be improved. As part of the administration's goal of an effective and efficient government, the ODNI has already begun a review of the entire intelligence community to include the office of the DNI and to answer the very questions about how we can make our process even more streamlined, more efficient, and more effective. My office is proud to lead this review, and I look forward to the confirmation of my principal deputy in order to shepherd this process to completion, and I have total confidence in her that she has the capacity and capability to effectively lead this effort. The recently passed, uh, passed Intelligence Authorization Bill also includes the requirement for a review of the IC, focused on structures and authorities, 10 years beyond the intelligence reforms of the mid-2000s. Between these two reviews, I am confident that I will be able to report back to the committee with constructive recommendations on the best ways forward for the whole of the IC. In the short time I've been on this job, I have learned that the IC is full of dedicated, talented, creative, and patriotic men and women who are committed to keeping America safe. We must retain this posture while looking for ways to improve. In conclusion, the intelligence community will continue its tireless work against these and all threats, but we will never be omniscient. 
Although we have extensive insight into many threats and places around the world, we have gaps in others. Therefore, we very much appreciate the support provided by this committee and will continue to work with you to ensure that the intelligence community has the capabilities it needs to meet its many mission needs. And with that, we are ready to take your questions. Director Coates, thank you for that very thorough and comprehensive testimony on behalf of the intelligence community. Um, Dan, quite frankly, you make us proud seeing one of our own now head the entire intelligence community, and I want to thank you and Marsha personally for your willingness to do that. Thank you. And to also pass to you, we are anxious for your deputy to be considered by the committee. Would you please send us a nomination? We are doing our very best to do that, and I'm, nobody's more anxious than me. I'm, I'm sure that's the case. I'm going to recognize myself for five minutes. Director McCabe, did you ever hear Director Comey tell the President that he was not the subject of an investigation? Uh, excuse me, did you ever hear Director Comey tell the President he was not the subject of an investigation? Could you do your microphone, please? Rookie mistake, I'm sorry. Sir, I can't comment. Uh, on any conversations the director may have had with the president. Okay. General Stewart, you heard Director Coates state on everybody's behalf that there is an expected deterioration of conditions in Afghanistan. Can you give us DIA's assessment of the situation today in Afghanistan and what would change that deterioration? Uh, thanks, Mr. Chairman. I, I pay close attention to the operations in Afghanistan. I make two trips there each year, one before the fighting season and one following the fighting season. That way I get on the ground uh, my own personal assessment of how things are going. I was there about six weeks ago. The NDSF, uh, two years into taking control of the security environment, uh, the NDSF had uh, mixed results in uh, this past year. Uh, those mixed results can be characterized, can characterize a security environment as a stalemate. And left unchecked, that stalemate will deteriorate in the favor of the belligerents. So we have to do something very different than uh, what we've been doing in the past. Let me back out just a little bit and talk about the fact that uh, the Taliban failed to meet any of their strategic objectives that they outlined during the last fighting season. They controlled no uh, district centers. They were able to execute uh, high uh, visibility attacks, which causes a psychological effect that has a debilitating effect. They maintained some influence in the rural areas, but they controlled none of the large district centers. Having said that, the uh, uh, Afghan National Defense uh, Security Forces uh, did not meet their force generation objectives. They had uh, some success in training the force, they were uh, able to manage a crisis better than they have in the past. They were able to deploy forces, but failed, in my opinion, to employ the ISR uh, and the fire support to make them as effective on the battlefield as possible. Unless we change something where we introduce either U.S. forces, NATO forces, that changes the balance of uh, forces on the ground, changes the fighting outputs on the ground, or add additional training and advising capability at lower levels than we do now, the situation will continue to deteriorate and we'll lose all the gains that we've invested in over the last several years. So they've got to get uh, more trainers uh, below the core level, I believe. Uh, not sure how far down. Or they have to get more uh, personnel on the ground, generate greater forces, greater fire support, greater use of uh, ISR, or this will, in fact, deteriorate further. Thank you, General. Um, Admiral Rogers, every aspect of our daily lives continues to become part of a traceable, trackable interaction, interacting environment uh, now known as the Internet of Things. In addition, artificial intelligence, or AI, has increasingly enabled technology to become autonomous. What is the IC's current assessment of the ever-changing capabilities of the Internet of Things and what it presents? So it represents both 
opportunity, but on, from an information assurance or computer network defense perspective, it represents great concern. Where the ability to harness literally millions of devices that were built for very simple day-to-day -day activities suddenly can be tied together and focused and oriented to achieve a specific outcome. We've seen this with denial of service attempts against a uh, couple significant companies on the East Coast of the United States in the course of the last year. This is going to be a trend in the future. It's part of the discussions we're having. I'm, I'm in the midst of having some discussions in the private sector with this is going to be a problem that's common to both of us. How can we work together to try to, number one, understand this technology, and number two, ask ourselves how do we ensure that it's not turned around, if you will, against us? Um, thank you for that. Uh, Admiral Rogers, I'll, I'll probably put this to you as well. Section 702 of the FISA Amendments Act authorizes the government to target only non-U.S. persons reasonably believed to be located outside the United States for the purposes of acquiring foreign intelligence information. Section 702 cannot be used to target any person located inside the United States, and the law prohibits the government from reverse targeting, that is, targeting a non-U.S. person outside the United States specifically for the purpose of collecting the communications of a person inside the United States. The IC uses FISA 702 collection authority to detect, identify, and disrupt terrorist and other national security threats. How would you characterize 702 authority and its importance to the current intelligence collection platform overall? If we were to lose 702's authorities, we would be significantly degraded in our ability to provide timely warning and insight as to what terrorist actors, nation states, criminal elements um, are doing that is of concern to our nation as well as our friends and allies. This 702 has provided us insight that is focused both on counterterrorism but as well as counterproliferation, understanding what nation states are doing. It's given us tremendous insights in the computer network defense arena. I would highlight much, not all, much of what was in the intelligence community's assessment, for example, on the Russian efforts against the U.S. election process in 2016 was informed by knowledge we gained through 702 authority. Thank you for that. Vice Chairman. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I've got a couple questions that I hopefully will be only require yes or no answers. First, for the whole panel, as the assembled leadership of the intelligence community, do you believe that the January 2017 intel intelligence community assessment accurately characterized the extent of Russian activities in the 2016 election and its conclusion that Ru Russian intelligence agencies were responsible for the hacking and leaking of information and using misinformation in order to influence our elections? Simple yes or no would, would suffice. I do. Yes, sir. Yes, Senator. Yes, I do. Yes, I do. Yes. Yes. And I guess the presumption, that, or the next presumption, I won't even ask this question, is consequently that committee assessment or that community assessment was unanimous and is not a piece of fake news or evidence of some other individual or nation state other than Russia. So I appreciate that again for the record. Um, I warned you, Mr. McCabe, I was going to I have to get the, you on the record as well on this. Mr. McCabe, for as long as you are acting FBI director, do you commit to informing this committee of any effort to interfere with the FBI's ongoing investigation into links between Russia and the Trump campaign? I absolutely do. Thank you so much for that. I think in, in light of what's happened in the last um, 48 hours, it's critically important that we have that assurance, and I hope you'll um, relay at least from me to the, you know, the extraordinary people who work at the FBI uh, that this committee supports them, supports their efforts, supports their professionalism, and supports their independence. I will, sir. Thank you. In light of the fact that we just saw French elections where felt like deja vu all over again in terms of the release of uh, a series of emails against Mr. Macron days before the election, and the fact that this committee continues to investigate the type of tactics that Russia has used. Where do we stand as a country in terms of 
preparation to make sure this doesn't happen again in 2018 and 2020? Uh, where have we moved in terms of collaboration with state voting voter files, in terms of working more with uh, the tech community, particularly the platform, uh, platform entities, in terms of how we can better uh, assure uh, real news versus fake news? Is there some general sense, Director Coates, I know you've only been in the job for a short period of time, of how we're going to have a strategic effort? Because while it was Russia in 2016, other nation states could uh, you know, launch similar type assaults. Well, we, are, we will continue uh, to uh, use all the assets that we have in terms of collection uh, and analysis relative to what the influence uh, has been and potentially could be uh, in future. Uh, the Russians have uh, spread this across the, the globe. I've, interestingly enough, I met with the Prime Minister of Montenegro, the mm -hmm. latest uh, nation to join NATO, the number 29th nation. Um, what was the main topic? Russian interference in their political system. And so it does, it, it sweeps across uh, Europe and other places. It's clear, though, the Russians have upped their game using social media uh, and other opportunities that we have in ways we haven't seen before. So it's a great threat to our, our democratic process. And our job here is to provide the best intelligence we can to the policymakers to, as they develop a strategy in terms of how to best uh, reflect uh, a response to this. Well, one of the things I'm concerned about is we've all expressed this concern, but since this doesn't fall neatly into any particular agency's jurisdiction, you know, who's, who's taking the point on interacting with the platform companies, a la the Google, Facebook, and Twitters? Who's taking the point in terms of interacting DHS, I imagine, in terms of state boards of election? How are we trying to ensure that our systems are more secure? And if we could get a brief answer on that, because I have one last question for, for Admiral Rogers. Well, I think the, 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 the obviously our office tasks and takes the point, but there's contribution from agencies across uh, the IC. Uh, we will uh, might ask Director Pompeo to. Um, address that and others might want to address that also but each of us each of the agencies to the extent that they can uh, and have the capacity whether it's NSA through SIGINT whether it's CIA through HUMIT or other sources uh, will provide information to us that we want to use as a basis to provide to our to our policymakers uh, relative to a grand strategy um, uh, I, I am not aware right now of, of any um, I think we're still assessing the impact. Uh, we have not put a st grand strategy together, which would this not be our purview. We would provide the basis of intelligence that would then uh, be the foundation for what that strategy would be. Well, my hope, my hope would be that um, you know, we need to be proactive in this. We don't want to be sitting here kind of looking back at it after a 2018 election cycle. Last question, very briefly, Adam Rogers. Do you have any doubt that the Russians are behind the uh, intervention in the French elections? Um, I, let me phrase it this way. We are aware of some Russian, Russian activity directed against the Russian, excuse me, directed against the French election process. As I previously said before Congress earlier this week, we in fact reached out to our French counterparts to say, we have become aware of this activity. We want to make you aware. What are you seeing? I'm not in a position to have looked at the breadth of the French infrastructure. So I, I'm, I'm not really in a position to make a whole simple declaratory statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Rubio. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. McCabe, uh, can you, without going to the specific of any individual investigation, I think the American people want to know, has the dismissal of Mr. Comey in any way impeded, interrupted, stopped, or negatively impacted any of the work, any investigation, or any ongoing projects at the Federal Bureau of Investigations? As you know, Senator, <clears throat> the work of the men and women of the FBI continues despite any um, changes in circumstance, any decisions. Um, so there has been no effort to impede our investigation to date. Quite simply put, sir, you cannot stop the men and women of the FBI from doing the right thing, protecting the American people, and upholding the Constitution.
And this is for all the members of the committee, as has been widely reported, uh, uh, and people know this, uh, uh, Kaspersky Lab software is used by not hundreds of thousands, millions of Americans. Uh, to each of our witnesses, I would just ask, would any of you be comfortable with the Kaspersky Lab uh, software on your computers? A resounding no for me. No. No, Senator. No, sir. No, Senator. No, sir. On the uh, Director Pompeo, uh, on the Venezuela, which was mentioned in uh, Director Coates' uh, statements, as all of you are probably well aware, armed civilian groups or colectivos, these uh, militias in the street, have been uh, armed by the regime for purposes of defending, for lack of a better term, the regime from protesters. We all are aware of the Maduro regime's cozy relationship with Hezbollah, with the FARC, which is a designated terrorist organization, and links to narco-trafficking. Among the weapons in the stockpile, the military in Venezuela, are IGLA-S, these basically Russian variant of our Stinger missiles. Um, and uh, Director Pompeo, if you could comment on the risk that I believe exists, that as these groups become more desperate, potentially even operate at some point outside the control of the Maduro regime, uh, they're running around in the streets, also in search of money and food and anything else that they want to get their hands on, the threat of any advanced weaponry, such as what I've just mentioned, being sold or transferred to uh, the FARC, a terrorist organization, uh, sold to drug cartels in Mexico, potentially, or even sold to terrorist organizations on the black market. Is that a real threat? Is that something we should be cognizant of? Senator, it is a real threat. Uh, as we have all seen, the situation in Venezuela continues to deteriorate. Maduro gets more desperate by the hour. Uh, the risk of these colectivos acting in a way that is uh, not under his control increases as time goes on as well. Uh, in classified setting, I'm happy to share with you a little bit more about the details of what we know. We have not seen any of those major arms transfers take place. We don't have any evidence that those have taken place to date. Uh, but those stockpiles exist not only uh, not only in the Maduro regime, but other places as well. There are plenty of weapons running around in Venezuela, and this risk is incredibly real and serious and ultimately a threat to South America and Central America, in addition to just in Venezuela. Staying in the Western Hemisphere for, for a moment, and, and this uh, potentially is also to the Director, uh, Director McKay, but certainly to you, Director Pompeo, I continue to be concerned about the potential, and I believe is the reality, of a concerted effort on the part of the Cuban government to wittingly enlist uh, Americans, uh, business executives, and others, even local and state political leaders, uh, in an effort to have them influence uh, U.S. policymaking on Cuba, and particularly the lifting of the embargo. Uh, would this be a tactic consistent with what we have seen in the past from other nation states, including uh, the regime in Cuba? I'll, I'll let Mr. McKay make a comment as well. But yes, of course. Frankly, this is consistent with what we right. This is the the the, the attempt to interfere in, in the United States is not limited to Russia. <laughs> Uh, the Cubans have deep ties. Uh, it, it is uh, in their deepest tradition to take American visitors uh, and do their best to influence them in a way that is an adverse to U.S. interests. Yes, sir. F uh, fully agree. We share your concerns about that issue. And my final question is, on this, all this focus on Russia and what's happened in the past, uh, is it the opinion of all of you, or those of you certainly all have insight on this, that even as we focus on 2016 and the efforts leading up to that election, efforts to influence policymaking here in the United States vis-a-vis -vis the Russian interests are ongoing, that the Russians continue to use active measures, even at this moment, even on this day, to try, to, through the use of multiple different ways, to influence the political debate and uh, the decisions made in, in American politics, particularly as they pertain to Russia's interests around the world. In essence, these active measures is an ongoing threat, not simply something that happened in the past. Yes, sir, that's right. Senator, it's right. Uh, in some sense, though, we have to put in context. This has been going on for a long time. There's, there's nothing new. Only the cost has been lessened, the cost of doing it. I, I would just add that uh, the use of cyber and social media um, significantly increased the impact uh, and the capabilities uh, that Russia – obviously, this has been, been done for years and years, even decades, but uh, – uh, the ability they have to to use um, the interconnectedness and, and all the bus all that that provides uh, that didn't provide before I, they've literally upped their game to the point where it's having a significant impact. 
from my perspective, I would just highlight cyber is enabling them to access information in massive quantities that weren't quite attainable to the same level previously. Um, and that's just another tool in their attempt to acquire information, misuse of that information, manipulation, outright lies, inaccuracies at times, but another times actually dumping raw data, which is as we also saw during this last presidential election cycle for us. Senator Feinstein. Thanks very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, where there's obviously more than one threat to our country, I would argue that the greatest danger to the United States is North Korea. And I'm one of those who have been very worried and trying to follow this as close as possible. In the statement for the record, you state, and I quote, North Korea's nuclear weapons and missile programs will continue to pose a serious threat to U.S. interests and to the security environment in East Asia in 2017. You go on to, thank, to state Pyongyang is committed yeah, thank to developing a long-range nuclear-armed missile that is capable of posing a direct threat to the United States. These assessments, combined with North Korea's behavior, recent ballistic missile launches, and proximity to U.S. forces and allies in Asia is deeply concerning. For the purpose of this open hearing, could e each of you express the threat posed by North Korea in this public setting and then address, most importantly, some of the specific actions we're, taken, we're taking as a nation? And some of it you may want to do in the closed hearing later. I think we could get into a greater detail in the closed hearing, uh, but it's clear that um, we have assessed this as a, a very significant, potentially existential threat to the United States that has to be addressed. Um, you're aware there has been considerable uh, discussion among the policymakers uh, with our providing intelligence uh, uh, with, it, with the administration relative to steps moving forward. General Mattis has taken a major role in this, uh, as well as our Secretary of State uh, and others. Um, the uh, uh, interaction with the Chinese uh, uh, of late, um, we think it can play a significant role in terms of how we deal with this. Uh, we have uh, dedicated a very significant amount of our intelligence resources uh, to uh, North, the issue of North Korea. And um, I think we'd look forward to going deeper into all of well, that. Let me ask this. Classified session. Is it possible in this hearing to estimate when they will have uh, an intercontinental ballistic missile capable of taking a nuclear warhead? I, uh, I, th I think it would be best if we save that for the uh, those kind of details for the uh, closed session. Can you say in this session how effective China has been in stopping some of the testing? Senator Feinstein, let me, let me try and answer that as best I can. I actually just returned from Korea. I was there last week. I had a chance to be with our great soldiers, General Brooks and his team, as well as the great soldiers of the Republic of Korea Army who are on the front lines there. They're doing amazing work in a difficult condition. Uh, with respect to the Chinese, um, they have made efforts in a way that they have not made before Good. in an effort to uh, close down uh, the trade that they have and putting pressure, diplomatic pressure as well, on the North Koreans. Uh, uh, the intelligence would suggest that uh, we're going to need more to shake free this uh, terribly challenging problem and, and that they could do more and they have the capacity to do more as well. Could you be specific? It's my honor. Have they entirely stopped coal? What de to what degree have they reduced it? How about oil and other commodities? I'd prefer to defer the details of that to the classified setting, um, but there have been restrictions on coal uh, that have been significant. Is there any other comment? If, uh, if I could, uh, Senator, uh, North Korea has declared its intent it said it publicly. It produces propaganda uh, images that shows their intent to de develop uh, intercontinental missiles, nuclear armed. What we've not seen them do is do a complete end-to-end -end test of an ICBM with a nuclear device. Uh, in the closed session, we can talk about how close they might be to doing that. But they're certainly on parallel paths, uh, nuclear device, processing enough fissile material for nuclear warheads, 
and developing a wide range of missile technology, short, intermediate, long-range missile technology. So they're going to put those two together at some point, but we have not seen them do that, test it end-to-end. Uh, missile launch, uh, uh, intercontinental range, miniaturization, and survival of a reentry vehicle. But they're on that path, and they're committed to doing that. Thank you. I just add, Senator, on top of General Stewart's comments, that they are in a race. He's pushing very hard on the accelerator here. This whole panel is well aware of that, and, and we are doing everything in our power, and we can give you the details enclosed to make sure that uh, we give you and our, our customers the advantage to win that race. If I might just say, Mr. Cardillo, um, you've, you've given us very good information, very solid information. It is much appreciated. Uh, I think, uh, you know, it is time for the American people to begin to understand that, as the director said, we do, in fact, have an existential threat in the Pacific Ocean, and we need to come to grips with it. Senator Blunt. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, uh, Director Coates, let, let me join everybody else and welcome you back to the committee, uh, this time on the other side of the, of the hearing uh, table. But uh, please, along with others, you take this responsibility. It's my understanding, I want to talk just a little bit about the two executive orders on uh, vetting that the President has been challenged on in court. My understanding is you're, as the DNI, involved in that vetting in that process. Is that right? Um, the screening process, is that something that reports up through you? You're talking about the classification yes. process? Well, I'm talking about the extreme vetting where the President's issued. The first executive order was January the 20. 7th, where the President's order said that we'd suspend refugee admissions from certain countries for 90 days pending a review. There's also 120 days mentioned in that order. And since we're beyond 90 days and approaching 120 days, my real question is, are we, in spite of what's happening outside of the organization, are we continuing to pursue that timeline and are we about to get to the 120 days of having that review period behind us. I would like to take that question and get back to you with the specifics relative to the days away, um, what has been done uh, to this particular date, and are we on, on target? Obviously, this is going, this is going forward. Um, I don't have uh, the details in front of me right now, um, but I'd be happy to get that information for you. Good. I'd be interested in that. I'd be very concerned, frankly, if we're now over 100, close to 120 days into that time frame to find out that the 120 days didn't get the job done because we were waiting to figure out how the order could be properly enforced. And so I'd, I'd be very interested in that. Uh, on the cyber front, uh, Director Cardillo, I'm, I know among other things your organization has conducted uh, what you've called hackathons, or at least have been called hackathons. What has that done in terms of bringing other people into the discussion of how we protect ourselves better from these cyber attacks? Sure. Thank you, Senator. So we're quite proud at NGA of our history of support to the community and to you, but through predominantly historically um, closed uh, systems, government-owned systems, et cetera, as the committee's already discussed and the panel's responded uh, clearly. Uh, uh, the, the high-tech reality of our world, the interconnectedness of the Internet, et cetera. So what we're trying to do is take that historic success of our expertise and our experience and then engage with that community in a way that we can better leverage our data in a way to inform and warn you. And so uh, I'm trying to tap into the agility and the innovation of that community. We use these hackathons to put out uh, uh, challenge questions in which we can engage with industry and academia in a way that will enable us to do our job better. Let me ask one more question of you. We had, uh, we had a witness before this committee on uh, March the 30th in an open hearing, uh, Clint Watts, who observed that he said, quote, the intelligence community is very biased against open source information. That ends his quote. 
I may come to you on that too, Director Pompeo, but in terms of geospatial, what, what are you doing there with open source information? Well, we're we're engaging. Um, as Admiral Rogers mentioned, though, there you know there's an upside to this connectedness and the fact that that the commercial market and the commercial imagery market is getting into a business that was prior on a government only uh, entity uh, has great advantage. And we seek to build on that and take take advantage of those developments. We also need to go in eyes wide open and realize that there is a risk. So I don't have a bias. I have an awareness. An appreciation for this open uh, development and innovation, and my commitment is to smartly engage with it to make sure that we we use the best of it while we're aware that there there is a risk as we do so. Uh, Director Pompeo, do you think that was a fair criticism that the intelligence community is uh, biased against using open source information? Senator Blunt, I think historically that may well have been true. Uh, I don't think that's the case today. Uh, we have an enormous open source enterprise uh, that does its best to stay up with world, be world class in information management, get information that is not not stolen secrets, but open source information uh, to the right place at the right time to help inform the intelligence that we provide to you and to our other customers. So today, I would I would say that statement is inaccurate. Thank you, Director. Thank you, Chairman. Senator Cornyn. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Let me uh, ask, uh, let me highlight one issue and then ask a question, uh, Director Coates, about uh, uh, another issue, and I'd invite comment from anyone who has something they want to offer. I've been increasingly concerned about foreign governments hiring lobbyists here in Washington and, unbeknownst to members of Congress, actually lobbying uh, Congress to enact policies which uh, may be contrary to the best interests of the American people. Of course, the Foreign Agent Registration Act provides some level of transparency for that, but I just highlight that issue and uh, we can come back to it at a later time because I want to ask you about a another topic as well. Um, the Committee on Foreign Investment in the United States, or CFIUS, uh, provides a very important role in determining whether there are technology transfers from the United States to foreign governments. Um, and I was happy to see, Director Coach, your comments on page four of your written statement, uh, specifically regarding China's increasing effort to use investment as a way to improve its technological capabilities. Uh, China, we've seen, continues to use an aggressive campaign to vacuum up advanced U.S. technology, however and whenever it can, whether stealing it through cyber or buying it um, in the open market. Um, do you feel like uh, the current CFIUS process adequately protects against this threat vector and are all elements of the U.S. government cognizant of these vulnerabilities? I can't speak to how many agents uh, of, of the U.S. government are as cognizant as perhaps we should be, but I certainly think that um, given China's aggressive approach uh, relative to information um, uh, gathering and, and all the things that you mentioned, uh, merits uh, a, a review of CFIUS in terms of whether or not it, it needs to have some changes or innovations uh, uh, to, to address the uh, uh, aggressive, aggressive uh, Chinese uh, actions, uh, not just against our companies but across the world. They, they clearly have a strategy um, through their investments. Uh, they've started a, a major investment bank. Um, you name a part of the world, uh, Chinese probably are, are there looking to put investments in. We've seen the situation in Djibouti where they're uh, also adding military capability uh, to uh, their investment um, strategic area uh, uh, for uh, on the Horn of Africa there that, that – um, you wouldn't necessarily expect it, but they're active in Africa, Northern Africa. They're active across the world. They're one belt, um, one road uh, process uh, opens uh, opens their trade and, and what other interest they have uh, to the Indian Ocean and in, in, in a different way th to address uh, nations that they've uh, had difficulty connecting with. So it's uh, uh, it, it's clearly an issue that we ought to, we ought to take a look at. Thank you. Senator, Senator Cor if I might Go just add one comment. I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, 
Two, two quick comments. One on CFIUS. Uh, you know, it, it, it mostly deals with change of control transactions, purchases. There are many other ways one can invest in an entity here in the United States and exert significant control over that entity. I think that ought to be looked at. And then second, uh, and apart from CFIUS, um, there are many vectors. You mentioned several. Another place is our educational institutions, uh, where there are many folks coming here, uh, some of who are coming here in good faith to learn, but others who are being sent here with uh, less noble undertakings and missions. And the only additional comment I was going to make, what it is clear as we watch China and other nations, they are gaining greater insights as to our CFIUS processes, the criteria that we use that tend to shape our decision process. And so I think that's also an issue of concern that we're aware of here. Thank you. I look forward to visiting with you in the closed session later on. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator White. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Gentlemen, it's fair to say I disagreed with Director Comey as much as anyone in this room. But the timing of this firing is wrong to anyone with a semblance of ethics. Director Comey should be here this morning testifying to the American people about where the investigation he's been running stands. At our public hearing in January when he refused to discuss his investigation into connections between Russia and Trump associates, I stated my fear that if the information didn't come out before Inauguration Day, it might never come out. With all the recent talk in recent weeks about whether there is evidence of collusion, I fear some colleagues have forgotten that Donald Trump urged the Russians to hack his opponents. He also said repeatedly that he loved WikiLeaks. So the question is not whether Donald Trump actively encouraged the Russians and WikiLeaks to attack our democracy. He did. That is an established fact. The only question is whether he or someone associated with him coordinated with the Russians. Now, Mr. McCabe, the president's letter to Director Comey asserted that on three separate occasions, the director informed him that he was not under investigations. Would it have been wrong for the director to inform him he was not under investigation? So yes or no? <coughs> Sir, I'm not going to comment on any conversations that the director may have had. I didn't had ask with that. The Would it have been wrong for the director to inform him he was not under investigation? That's not about conversations. That's yes or no answer. As you know, Senator, we typically do not answer that question. I will not comment on whether or not the director and the president of the United States had that conversation. Will you refrain from these kinds of alleged updates to the president or anyone else in the White House on the status of the investigation? I will. Thank you. Director Pompeo, one of the few key unanswered questions is why the president didn't fire Michael Flynn after acting Attorney General Yates warned the White House that he could be blackmailed by the Russians. Director Pompeo, did you know about the acting attorney general's warnings to the White House, or were you aware of the concerns behind the warning? I, I don't have any comment on that. Well, were you aware of the concerns behind the warning? I mean, this is a global threat. This is a global threat question. It's a global threat hearing. Tell Who me, are you aware? Senator, tell me what global threat it is you're concerned with. Please, I'm, I'm not sure I understand the question. Well, the possibility of blackmail? I mean, blackmail by an influential military official? That has real ramifications for the global threat. So this is not about a policy implement, uh, implication. This is about the national security advisor being vulnerable to blackmail by the Russians. The American people deserve to know whether in these extraordinary circumstances the CIA kept them safe. Yes, sir. The CIA has kept America safe. And, so, the, and the people at the Central Intelligence Agency are committed to that and will remain committed to that. And so we, you, will, you, we, will do that answer, we will do that in the face you of... You won't answer the question. We will do that in the face of political challenges that come from any direction, but Senator. But you will not answer the question of whether or not you were aware of the concerns behind the Yates warning. So I, I don't know exactly what you're referring to with the Yates warning. I, I, I wasn't part of any of those conversations. The Yates I, I, warning I, I, was... I literally, Senator, I have, I, have no, I, have no, I have no firsthand information with respect to the warning that was given. Okay. Uh, she didn't make that warning to me. I, 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 can't, I can't answer that question, okay. Senator, as much as I would like to. Okay. Director Coates. 
How concerned are you that a Russian government oil company run by a Putin crony could end up owning a significant percentage of U.S. oil refining capacity? And what are you advising the Committee on Foreign Investment in the United States about this? I don't have specific information relative to that. Um, I think that's something that potentially uh, we could provide intelligence on in terms of um, uh, what, this, what the situation uh, might be. But uh, I'd like you to furnish that in writing. Let me see if I can get one other question um, in. There have been mountains of press stories with allegations about financial connections between Russia and Trump and his associates. The matters are directly relevant to the FBI. And my question is, when it comes to illicit Russian money, and in particular its potential to be laundered on its way to the United States, what should the committee be most concerned about? We hear stories about Deutsche Bank, Bank of Cyprus, shell companies in uh, Moldova, the British Virgin Islands. I'd like to get your sense, because I'm over my time, uh, Director McCabe. Uh, what should we most be most concerned about with respect to illicit uh, Russian money and its, and its potential to be laundered on its way to the United States? Yes, certainly, sir. So as you know, I am not in a position to be able to speak about specific investigations and certainly not in this setting. However, I will confirm for you that those are issues that concern us greatly. Uh, they have traditionally, and they do even more so today, as it becomes uh, easier to conceal the origin and the, and the uh, track and the destination and purpose of illicit money flows, as uh, the exchange of information becomes more clouded in encryption and more obtuse, uh, it becomes harder and harder to get to the bottom of those investigations that would shed light on those issues. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Rich. Thank you very much. Um, Gentlemen, I, uh, I've, the, the purpose of this hearing, as the uh, chairman expressed, is to give the American people some insight into what we all do, which they don't see uh, pretty much at all. And uh, so I, I think uh, what I want to do is I want to make an observation, and then I want to get uh, your take on it. Anybody who wants to volunteer, and I'm going to start with you, uh, Senator, Director Coates, uh, to volunteer. Uh, my, I have been, uh, I've been on this committee all the time. I've been here in the Senate and uh, all through the last administration. And I have been uh, greatly impressed by the current administration's uh, hitting the ground running during the first 100 days as far as their engagement on intelligence matters and their engagement with uh, foreign countries. The media, the national media here is uh, focused on uh, domestic issues, which is of great interest to the American people, be it health care, be it personnel issues uh, in the government. And they don't, uh, the, the media isn't as focused on uh, this administration's uh, fast and, in my judgment, robust engagement uh, with the intelligence communities uh, around the world and uh, with other governments. Um, and my impression is that it's good and it is aggressive. And I'd, want, I'd, like, your, uh, I'd, I'd like your impression of, of where we're going. Mo almost all of you had real engagement in the last uh, administration, and all the administrations are different. So, Director Coates, you want to take that on to start with? I'd be happy to start with that. I think most presidents uh, that come into office uh, come with an agenda in mind in terms of what issues they'd like to pursue. Many of them uh, issues that affect uh, uh, domestic issues that affect infrastructure, uh, education, uh, a number of things, only to find that this is a dangerous world that the United States, uh, the, the threats that exist out there need to be, be given attention to. Um, this president, who I think um, uh, the perception was, uh, was not interested in that, uh, I think Director Pompeo and I can uh, certify the fact that we have spent far more hours in the Oval Office than we anticipated. The president is a, a, a voracious consumer of information and asking questions and asking us to provide uh, intelligence. Uh, I, we are both part of a process 
uh, run through the National Security Council, General McMaster, uh, all through the deputies uh, committees and the principals committees, um, consuming hours and hours and hours of time looking at the threats. How do we address those threats? What is the intelligence that tells us, uh, that informs the policymakers in terms of how they put a strategy in place? And so um, uh, what uh, I initially thought would be um, uh, a one or two time a week, uh, to 10 to 15 minute quick brief uh, has turned into an everyday uh, sometimes uh, exceeding uh, 45 minutes to an hour or more, uh, just in briefing the president. Um, we have, uh, I have brought along several of our directors uh, to come and uh, show the president what their agencies do and how important it is and the that the information they provide how the, that the, for the basis of making policy decisions. I'd like to turn to my CIA colleague here to get, to get let him give you and others uh, to give you their impression. I appreciate that. We're almost out of time, but I did, uh, Director Pompey, you kind of sit in the same spot we all sit in through the last uh, uh, several years, and uh, I kind of like your observations along the line of, uh, of Director Coates. What, yeah, what um, do you feel about the matter? I think Director Coates had it right. Uh, the, the, he and I spend time with the President every day, briefing him on the most urgent intelligence matters that are presented to us as in our roles. Uh, he asks good, hard questions, makes us go make sure we're doing our work in the right way. Uh, second, you asked about engagement in the world. Uh, this administration has re-entered the battle space in places the administration, the previous administration was completely absent. You all travel some, too. Yep. Uh, you will hear that when you go travel. I've now taken two trips uh, to places, and they welcome uh, American leadership. They're not looking for American soldiers. They're not looking for American boots on the ground. They're looking for American leadership around the globe. And this president has re-entered that space in a way that I think will serve America's interest very well. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. And uh, we, we deal with them not only overseas, but they come here, as you know, regularly. Yes, sir. And the fact that the president has pulled the trigger twice as he has in the, in the first 100 days and, and done it uh, uh, in a fashion that uh, didn't start a world war and, uh, and was uh, watched by both our friends and our enemies uh, has made a significant and a huge difference as far as our standing in the world. My time's up. Thank you very much, Mr. Thank you, Senator. <laughs> Senator Heinrich. Uh, Director McCabe, you, uh, you obviously have several decades of law enforcement experience. Is it, is it your experience that people who are innocent of wrongdoing typically need to be reassured that they're not the subject of an investigation? No, sir. And I ask that because I'm still trying to make heads or tails of the dismissal letter from earlier this week from the president where he writes, while I greatly appreciate you informing me on three separate occasions that I am not under investigation, and I'm still trying to figure out why that would even make it into a dismissal letter. But let me go to something a little more direct. Um, Director, has anyone in the White House spoken to you directly about the Russia investigation? No, sir. Oh. <clears throat> Let me uh, when when did you last meet with the president, Director McCabe? I don't think I um, I don't think I'm um, was it in a earlier position to this comment week? on that. Uh, I have uh, met with the president this week, but I don't and, really want to go into the okay. details of that. But Ru Russia did not come up. That's correct. It okay. did not. Thank you. Um, we've heard in the news that that uh, claims that Director Comey had um, had lost the confidence of rank and file FBI employees. Um, you've been there for 21 years. In your opinion, um, is it accurate that the rank and file no longer supported Director Comey? Nope. No, sir. That is not accurate. I can tell you, sir, that um, I worked very, very closely with Director Comey from the moment he started at the FBI. I was his executive assistant director of national security at that time. I then worked for him running the Washington field office. And, of course, I've served as deputy for the last year. Um, I can tell you that I hold Director Comey in the absolute highest regard. I have the highest respect for his considerable abilities and his integrity. And it has been 
the greatest privilege and honor of my professional life to work with him. Um, I can tell you also that Director Comey enjoyed broad support within the FBI and still does to this day. We are a large organization. We are 36,500 people across this country, across this globe. We have a diversity of opinions about many things, um, but I can confidently tell you that the majority, the vast majority of FBI employees enjoyed a deep and positive connection to Director Comey. Thank you for your candor. Um, do you feel like you have the adequate resources for the existing investigations uh, that, the, uh, uh, that the Bureau is invested in right now to, uh, to follow them wherever they may lead? Sir, if you're referring to the Russia investigation, I do. I believe we have the adequate resources to do it, and I know that we have resourced that investigation adequately. If you're referring to the many um, constantly multiplying counterintelligence threats that we face across the spectrum, uh, they get bigger and more challenging every day, and resources uh, become an issue over time. Uh, but sure. in terms of that investigation, sir, I can, I can assure you we are covered. Thank you. Uh, Director Coates, welcome back. Um, would you agree that it is a national security risk to um, provide classified information to an, an individual who has been compromised by a foreign government as a broad matter? As a broad matter, yes. Mm -hmm. if, uh, if the Attorney General uh, came to you and said one of your employees was compromised, what, what sort of action would you take? I would um, uh, take the action as prescribed um, in our procedures relative to how we uh, report this uh, and how it's uh, how it is uh, processed. I mean, it's a serious a serious issue. Our our I would be consulting with our legal counsel and consulting with our inspector general and others uh, as to. Uh, how, how best to proceed with this, but obviously we would take action. Would, would one of the options be dismissal, obviously? That very potentially could be a dismissal, yes. Okay. Thank you, Director. Senator Collins. Thank you, Mr. Chairman or Mr. Vice Chairman. Mr. McCade, is the agent who is in charge of this very important investigation into Russian attempts to influence our elections last fall still in charge? I mean, we have many agents involved in the investigation at many levels, so I'm, I'm not sure who the you're referring to. The lead agent overseeing the investigation. Certainly, almost uh, all of the agents involved in the investigation are still in their positions. So has there been any curtailment of the FBI's activities in this important investigation since uh, Director Comey was fired? Ma'am, we don't curtail our activities. Um, as you know, um, has the, are people experiencing questions and um, are reacting to the developments this week? Absolutely. Does that get in the way of our ability to pursue this or any other investigation? No, ma'am. We continue to focus on our mission and get that job done. I want to follow up on a question of resources that Senator Heinrichs asked your opinion on. Press reports yesterday indicated that Director Comey requested additional resources from the Justice Department for the Bureau's ongoing investigation <laughs> into Russian active measures. Are you aware of that request? Can you confirm that that request was, in fact, made? Um, <clears throat> I cannot confirm that request was made. As you know, ma'am, when we need resources, we make those requests here. Um, so I, I don't, um, I'm not aware of that request, and it's not consistent with my understanding of how we request additional resources. That said, we don't typically request resources for an individual case, and as I mentioned, um, I strongly believe that the Russia investigation is adequately resourced. 
You've also been asked a question about target letters. Now, it's my understanding that when an individual is the target of an investigation, at some point a letter is sent out notifying the individual that he is a target. Is that correct? No, ma'am. I, I don't believe that's correct. So before there is going to be an indictment, there is not a target letter sent out by the Justice Department? Not that I'm aware of. Okay. I That's contrary to my, my understanding, but let me ask you the reverse. Again, I, I'm looking at it from the perspective of the investigators, so that's not part of our normal case investigative practice. That would be the Justice Department, though. The Justice Department. I see. I see. I'm, uh, I'm asking you, isn't it standard practice when someone is the target of an investigation and is perhaps on the verge of being indicted that the Justice Department sends that individual what is known as a target letter? Yeah, ma'am, I'm going to have to defer that question to the Department of Justice. Well, let me ask you the, the flip side of that and perhaps you don't know the answer to this question, but is it standard practice for the FBI to inform someone that they are not a target of an investigation? It is not. So it would be unusual and not standard practice for there, have, for there to have been a notification from the FBI director to President Trump or anyone else involved um, in this investigation informing him or her uh, that that individual is not a target. Is that correct? Again, ma'am, I'm not going to comment on what Director Comey may or may not have I'm, done. I'm not asking you to comment on the facts of the case. Right. I'm just trying to find out what's standard practice yes, and what's not. I'm not aware of that being a standard practice. Admiral Rogers, I want to follow up on Senator Warner's question to you about the attempted interference in the French, French election. Some researchers, including the cyber intelligence firm Flashpoint, claim that APT28 uh, is the group that was behind the stealing of and the leaking of the information about the president-elect of France. The FBI and DHS have publicly tied APT28 <coughs> to Russian intelligence services in the joint analysis report last year after the group's involvement in stealing data that was leaked in the run-up to the U.S. elections in November. Is the IC in a position to attribute the stealing and the leaking that took place prior to the French election uh, to be the result of activities by this group, which is linked to Russian cyber activity? Uh, again, ma'am, right now I don't think I have a complete picture of all the activity associated with France, but as I've said publicly both today and previously, we are aware of specific Russian activity directed against the French election cycle in the course, particularly of the last few weeks, to the point where we felt it was important enough we actually reached out to our French counterparts to inform them and make sure they had awareness of what we were aware of, and also to ask them, is there something we are missing that you are seeing? Thank you. <clears throat> Senator King. Mr. McCabe, thank you for being here today under somewhat difficult circumstances. We appreciate your candor and your testimony. On March 20th, Director Comey, then Director Comey, testified to the House of Representatives, I have been authorized by the Department of Justice to confirm that the FBI, as part of our counterintelligence mission, is investigating the Russian government's efforts to interfere in the 2016 presidential election, and that includes investigating the nature of any links between individuals associated with the Trump campaign and the Russian government, and whether there was any coordination between the campaign and Russian efforts. As with any counterintelligence investigation, this will also include an assessment of whether any crimes were committed. Is that statement still accurate? Yes, sir, it is. And uh, how many agents are assigned to this project, how many are personnel generally within the FBI, roughly? Yes, yeah, sir, I, I can't really answer the, those sorts of questions in this forum. 
Well, yesterday, a White House press spokesman said that this is one of the smallest things on the plate of the FBI. Is that an accurate statement? Uh, is it, this a it, small it, investigation in relation to, all, to uh, all the other work that you're doing? Sir, we consider it to be a highly significant investigation. So you would not characterize it as one of the smallest things you're engaged in? I would not. Thank you. Uh, let me uh, change the subject briefly. Uh, we're, we've been talking about Russia and, and their involvement in this election. Uh, one of the issues of concern to me, and perhaps I can direct this to, uh, uh, well, I'll direct it to anybody in the panel. The allegation of, of Russian involvement in our electoral systems, is that uh, an issue that uh, is of concern, and what do we know about that, and is that being followed up on by this investigation? Uh, Mr. McCabe, is that part of your investigation? No, I'm, ta I'm not talking about the presidential election. I'm talking about state-level election infrastructure. Yes, sir. So, um, so obviously not discussing any specific investigation um, in detail. The, the issue of Russian interference in the U.S. democratic process is one that causes us great concern. And quite frankly, it's something that we've spent a lot of time working on over the past several months. Um, and, and to reflect comments that were made in response to an earlier question uh, that uh, Director Coates handled, um, I think part of that process is to understand um, the inclinations of our foreign adversaries to interfere um, in those areas. So we've seen this once. We are better positioned to see it the next time. We're able to uh, improve not only our coordination with uh, primarily through the Department of Homeland, um, uh, through DHS, through their, their uh, expansive network into the uh, state and local um, election infrastructure, uh, but to interact with those folks, to put them in a better position to defend against whether it's cyber attacks or any sort of uh, influence-driven uh, uh, interactions. Thank you. I think that's a very important part of this issue. Uh, uh, Admiral Rogers, yesterday a camera crew from TASS was allowed into the <laughs> Oval Office. There was no American press allowed. Was there any consultation with you uh, with regard to that action in terms of the risk of some kind of uh, 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 cyber penetration or uh, uh, communications uh, in, in that incident? No. Were you, you weren't, your agency wasn't consulted in any way? Not that I'm aware of. I wouldn't expect that to automatically be the case, but no, not that I'm aware Did of. Did it raise any concerns when you saw those pictures that those cameramen I, and crew were in the Oval Office without? I'll be honest, I, I wasn't aware of where the images came from. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Coates, Director Coates, you, were, you're, you lead the, uh, the uh, intelligence community. Were you consulted? Uh, at all uh, with regard to the firing of uh, Director Comey? I was not. So you had no, there were no discussions w with you even though the FBI is an important part of the intelligence community? There were no discussions. <laughs> thank you. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Thank you, Senator King. Uh, Senator Langford. Thank you. Let me just run through some quick questions on this. Uh, Director McCabe, thanks for being here as well. Let me, let me hit some high points of some things that I've heard already just to be able to confirm. You have the resources you need for the Russian investigation. Is that correct? Yes, sir, we believe it's okay. adequately resourced. So there's not limitations or resources. You have what you need. The, the actions about Jim Comey and his release has not curtailed the investigation from the FBI. It's still moving forward. The investigation will move forward, absolutely. No agents have been removed that are the ongoing career folks that are doing the investigation. No, sir. Is it your impression at this point that the FBI is unable to complete the investigation in a fair and expeditious way because of the removal of Jim Comey? It is my uh, opinion and belief that the FBI will continue to pursue this investigation vigorously and completely. Do you need somebody to take this away from you and somebody else to do it? No, sir. Okay. Let me ask you a, a separate question. Uh, as I go through the report and tracking through the worldwide threats uh, that was put out, that Director Coates put out, there's a section on it on narcotics in the movement of illegal drugs. And there's a section on it about tens of thousands of illegal pharmacies that are online at this point distributing narcotics. And 18 to 20 of those go online a day still. 
Can you help me understand a little more about what the FBI is doing to be able to interdict, to be able to engage, how many of those are American, how many of those are international, and what we can do to be able to stop the movement of narcotics through our mail system? Yeah, yes, sir. So um, I, it's a, a great question and one that we spend a great deal of time on. As you know, the traffic of illegal narcotics uh, is something that we, along with our partners at the DEA and other law federal, state, and local law enforcement partners have focused on for many years. We've had uh, great success, but the issue, the threat continues to change, continues to develop, and, uh, and confront us in new ways. The uh, profusion of uh, illegal online pharmacies is certainly one of those ways, and quite frankly, it's something that we are uh, learning more about, spending more time on uh, every day. Well, I'm glad that it is highlighted in the report with tens of thousands of these pharmacies that are out there in the distribution systems. It's no longer a drug dealer on the corner anymore. They just deliver it to your house now, and there, there's a whole different set of issues that we aggressively need to address on this. Dr Director yes. Coates, I have, I have a, a question for you. We've talked often about a cyber doctrine, uh, and it's one of the issues that keeps being raised that uh, other nations and nation states and, and, and actors need to understand what our boundaries are and how we're going to do this. This seems to be talked to death, uh, and everyone that I raise it with says, yes, it needs to occur. What I need to know is who has the ball on leading out to make sure a year from now we're not talking about we need to get a cyber doctrine. I guess specifically, when we do this hearing next year, who should we hold accountable if we don't have a cyber doctrine? Well, that's a very good question. I think all of us would agree we need a cyber doctrine uh, because clearly it is one of the top, uh, if not the number one threat to, to, uh, today that we're dealing with. Um, as you know, the president uh, uh, tasked uh, an effort uh, under the direction of uh, former uh, Mayor Giuliani uh, with this. Uh, that has not led to a conclusion at this particular point in time. I don't have the details on that. Um, I would agree with you, however, that uh, this is a threat that uh, our policymakers uh, need, to, uh, need to address. Uh, I'm hoping that when we are here next year, we will have a, uh, a solid response uh, to your question. But at this particular point in time, Frankly, given the proliferation of issues that we're trying to deal with, uh, um, it's, all, it's almost overwhelming. And it is, and, that, and that's been our hands concern around all, all of them. There's just so many things that are flying around. This keeps getting left, and it has been for years, uh, been left. And what we need to try to figure out is how do we actually find out who's got the ball <clears throat> and who do we hold to account to be able to help us work through this, or is this something that we need to be able to work through? I, I noticed as I read through your report, which was excellent, by the way, and all the worldwide threats, Every single section of your report, every section of it, had a section on Iran. Every part of it, that there was a threat. In fact, in one section of it, you wrote, Iran continues to be the foremost state sponsor of terrorism. Whether it was cyber, whether it is active terrorism, whether it was involvement in every different nefarious action, it seems to always circle back to Iran at some point in some way of facilitating this. So th this, is, this is one of those areas that we've got to be able to figure out how to be able to deal with. Just in a broad question on it, and maybe General Stewart, you'd be the right one to be able to deal with this, but anyone could, could answer this. My concern is that when we're dealing with Syria, the focus seems to be on Russia in Syria or ISIS in Syria, and we're losing track of the movement of Iran through Iraq into Syria. We're losing track of what's happening in Yemen and other places. Who, wh what is your perception of Iran's goal through the Middle East? Is their goal higher for Yemen, or is it higher going into Syria and into Iraq and to be able to occupy and stay? And is the perception that the Russians want to remain there, or Iran wants to remain in Syria and be the dominant force there? Uh, clearly, Iran views themselves as the regional, the dominant regional power. Uh, they will continue to use uh, militia forces and uh, asymmetric forces to achieve the aims of controlling large parts of the region. If they can't control them physically, they tend to influence them politically. Syria becomes a very key strategic point for them. It allows them to leverage uh, the Syrian forces, Lebanese and Lebanese Hezbollah, uh, and move uh, capability and forces across the region. They will be in competition at some point with Russia. Russia views themselves as the regional power, uh, at least the dominant regional power today. I'm not sure that Russian and Iran's influence will remain aligned in the long term. In the near term, they're very closely aligned as it relates to propping up and securing the Syrian regime.
Thank you. Senator Manchin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank all of you for being here. I really appreciate it. And uh, I know that, uh, Mr. McCabe, uh, you seem to be of great interest of being here. And we're going to look forward to really uh, hearing from all of you all in the closed hearing this afternoon, which I think that we'll be able to get in more detail. So I appreciate that. I just have one question for Mr. McCabe. is basically the morale of the uh, agency, the FBI agency, and the morale basically starting back from J July 5th to July 7th, October 28th, November 6th, and the election day. Did you all ever think you'd be embroiled in an election process such as this? And did, what, what did it do to the morale? <clears throat> well, I, I don't know that anyone uh, envisioned exactly the way these things would develop. Um, you know, as I said earlier, uh, Senator, we are a, a large organization. We, are, we have a lot of diversity of opinions and, and uh, viewpoints on things. We are also a fiercely independent group. I'm just saying that basically before July 5th, before the first testimony that basically uh, Director Comey got involved in, prior to that, did you see a change in the morale? Just yes or no, yes of change, or more anxious, more concerned? I think morale has always been good. Okay. However, we had, um, there were folks within our agency who uh, were frustrated with the outcome of the Hillary Clinton uh, case, and, and some of those folks were very vocal about that, uh, those concerns. I'm sure we'll have more questions in the closed hearing, sir. But let me say that to the rest of you all, we talked about Kaspersky, the lab, KL lab. Do you all, have it, has it risen to your level being the head of all of our intelligence agencies and people that are mostly concerned about the security of our country, of having a Russian connection and a lab as far outreaching as KL Labs? Have, has it come with your IT people coming to you, or have you gone directly to them, making sure that you have no uh, interaction with KL or any of the contractors you do business with? Just down the line there, if you're Mr. Cardella. Well, we count on the expertise of Admiral Rogers and the FBI to protect our systems, and so I, I value that. But you have, you, have an IT, you have IT people, right? Absolutely. Have you talked to the IT people? Has it come to your concern that there might be a problem? I'm, I'm aware of the Kaspersky lab challenge and or threat? Well, let me tell you, it's more of a challenge, more than a challenge, sir. And I would hope that, I, I'm going down the line, but I hope that all of you, we are very much concerned about this, very much concerned about the security of our, of our country because no, we, of their involvement. We share that. General. We, we are tracking uh, Kaspersky and their software. There is, uh, as well as I know, and I checked this recently, no Kaspersky uh, software on our networks. Any contractor? Uh, now, the contractor piece might be a little bit harder to define, but uh, at this point, we see no connection between Kaspersky and contractor supporting I'm our IT. I'm personally aware and involved as the director of the National Security yes, Agency and the Kaspersky Lab issue. Yes, sir. It wasn't that long ago I was sitting up there talking, uh, raising issues about Kaspersky and yeah. its position here. And uh, that continues in this new job. It has risen to the director of the CIA as well, Senator Manchin. Great. Very concerned about it, sir, and we are focused on it closely. Only thing I would ask all of you, if you can, uh, give us a report back if you've swept all of your contractors to make sure they understand the certainty you have, concern that you have about this, and making sure that they can verify to you all that they're not involved whatsoever with any of Kaspersky's hardware. Uh, I'm going to switch to a couple of different things because of the national security, but, you know, the violent gangs that we have in the United States, and I know we don't talk about it much, and when you talk about you have MS-13, the Crips, you've got Hell's Angels, Aryan Brotherhood, it goes on and on and on. There's quite a few. Uh, what, is, what are we doing, and what is it to your level? Has it been brought to your level, the concern we have with these gangs within our country, really every part of our country? Anybody on the gangland? Yes, yeah, sir. So we spend a lot of time talking about that at the FBI. It's one of our highest priorities yeah, the in our program. resources to go after each one of these because they're interspersed all over the country. We do, sir. We've been focused on the gang threat for many years. It, like Much like the uh, uh, online pharmacy threat, it continues to change and develop. We think it's likely a, a, uh, having an impact on some of the elevated violent crime rates we see across the country. So we're doing, oh, spending a lot of time focused on that. The one, the one last question real quick. My time's running out is basically on uh, rare earth elements. I'm understanding ever since the closure of the California, uh, which is the Mountain Pass mine, which was the last uh, mine that we had that was giving us domestic source of rare earth elements, that's been closed and uh, now we're 100% dependent on foreign, on basically foreign purchases of rare earth elements for what we need every day to run this country. We don't do any of it. 
in this country anymore. And most of it comes from China. Do any of you have a concern about that? So, Senator Major, I'll speak to that. <clears throat> yes, we're concerned. Uh, we're, we do a lot of work to figure out where they are and help the intelligence community, help the policy community shape policies surrounding how we ought to treat this issue. But it's a very, it's a very real concern and obviously depends on the element. But we use them for important technologies uh, that keep us all safe, those, those very rare earth elements. Let me just say that I, it's been told to me that the Department of Defense needs about 800 tons of rare earth elements per yes, year. Sir. And I want you to make sure that you know West Virginia has the opportunity to provide this country with the rare earth elements it has because of our mining process and all of that that we extract through the mining process. We are happy to come to aid, sir. <laughs> Thank you, Senator. <laughs> Thank you, Senator Manchin. Uh, before I turn to Senator Cotton, can I say for members, the vice chair and I have to step out for a meeting um, that we can't push off. Uh, I would ask Senator Harris, Senator Cotton, to complete their first round of questions. Any member that seeks additional questions uh, will be recognized by the chair. I would ask you to limit those questions, if you can, but the chair will ask, will say, we're not going over five minutes for the second round of questions. It is my hope that we will give sufficient time to these six gentlemen to have some nutrition before we reconvene at 1.30 in 219. It's my understanding that there will be a vote circa 2 o'clock, and we will decide exactly how we handle that. But um, the closed hearings, we like to make sure that nobody misses anything, so we, we might uh, slightly adjust what we're doing. Mr. Chairman, just inquiry, and I appreciate your thoughtfulness. So in your departure, as we work through it, it's still acceptable to get another uh, five-minute round for those. Up to five minutes. Thank you. Senator Cotton. The inmates are running the asylum. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I think everyone here in this room and most Americans have come to appreciate the aggressiveness with which Russia uses active measures or covert influence operations, propaganda, call them whatever you will, um, as your agencies assess they did in uh, 2016 and in hacking into those emails and releasing them, uh, as news reports suggest they did in the French election. Last week, uh, that's one reason why I sought to revive the Russian Active Measures Working Group uh, in the FY17 Intelligence Authorization Act. Um, these activities, though, go far beyond elections, I think, as most of our witnesses know. Uh, former Director of the CIA, Bob Gates, in his memoir, From the Shadows, detailed Soviet covert influence campaigns designed to slow or thwart the U.S. development of nuclear delivery systems and warheads, missile defense systems, and deployment of intermediate range nuclear forces uh, systems to Europe. Specifically, on page 260 of his memoir, he writes, during the period, the Soviets mounted a massive covert action operation aimed at thwarting INF deployments by NATO. We at CIA devoted tremendous resources to an effort at the time to uncovering this Soviet covert campaign. Dr. Casey summarized this extraordinary effort in a paper he sent to Bush, Schultz, Weinberger, and Clark on January 18, 1983. We later published it and circulated it widely within the government and to the Allies, and finally provided an unclassified version for the public to use." End quote. I'd like to thank the CIA for digging up this unclassified version of the document and providing it to the committee, Soviet strategy to derail U.S. INF deployment, specifically undermining NATO solidarity in those deployments. I'd ask unanimous consent that it be included as part of the hearing transcript. And since the inmates are running the asylum, hearing no objection, we'll include it in the transcript. <laughs> Director Pompeo, earlier this year, uh, Dr. Roy uh, Godson testified that he believed that Russia was using active measures and covert influence efforts to undermine our nuclear modernization efforts, our missile defense deployments, and the INF Treaty uh, in keeping with these past practices. To the best of your ability in this setting, would you agree with the assessment that Russia is likely using such active measures to undermine U.S. nuclear modernization efforts and missile defenses? Yes. Thank you. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, the FY17 Intelligence Authorization Act included two unclassified provisions that I authored. One would be restarting that uh, old active measures working group. A second uh, would require additional scrutiny of Russian embassy officials who travel more than the prescribed distance from their duty station, whether it's their embassy 
or a consulate around the United States. Uh, in late 2016, when that bill was on the verge of passing, I personally received calls from high-ranking Obama administration officials asking me to withdraw them from the bill. I declined. The bill did not pass. It passed last week as part of the FY17 spending bill. I did not receive any objection from Trump administration officials uh, to include uh, from our intelligence community. Uh, Director Coates, are you aware of any objection that the Trump administration had to my two provisions? I'm not, no, I'm not aware of any objection. Director Pompeo? None. Do you know why the Obama administration objected to those two provisions in late 2016? I would add, after the 2016 presidential election? Well, it'd be pure speculation. I don't, I couldn't read it. I wasn't able to read the president's mind then, and I don't think I can read it now. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I'd like to turn my attention to a, a very important uh, provision of law I know that uh, you've discussed earlier, Section 702. Uh, Director Rogers, um, it's my understanding that uh, your agency is undertaking an effort to try to release some kind of unclassified estimate of the number of U.S. persons who might have been incidentally collected using 702 techniques, is that correct? So we're looking to see if we can quantify something that's of value to people outside the organization? Would, would that require you going in and conducting searches of uh, incidental collection that have been previously unexamined? That's part of the challenge. How do I generate insight that doesn't, in the so, process of generating the insight, violate the actual tenants? That we well, I was gonna say, so, we're, so we're, you're trying to produce an estimate that is designed to protect privacy rights, but to produce that estimate, you're going to have to violate privacy rights? Is that, that is a potential part of all of this. Seems hard to do. Yes, sir. That's why it has taken us a, a period of time, and that's why we're, we're in it, the midst of a dialogue. Is it, is it going to be possible to produce that kind of estimate without some degree of inaccuracy or misleading information or infringing upon the privacy rights of Americans? Probably not. If anyone in your agency, or for that matter, Director McCabe in yours, believes that uh, there is misconduct or privacy rights are not being protected, they could, I believe, under current law, come to your inspector general, mm -hmm. come to your general counsel. I assume you have open door policies. Whistleblower protections in addition, yes, sir. Yes, sir. And yeah, they, they can come to they you. They can come to this committee. And they come to the committee. So four, at least four different avenues. I'm probably missing some if they believe there are any abuses in the Section 702 problem. And anyone in their chain of command. Yeah. Um, I, I would ask that we proceed with caution before producing a report that might infringe on Americans' privacy rights needlessly uh, and that might make it even that much harder to reauthorize a critical program, something that Director McCabe, your predecessor last week, just characterized, if I can paraphrase, as a must-have program, not a nice-to-have program. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Cotton. Senator Harris. Thank you. Uh, Acting Director McCabe, <clears throat> welcome. I know you've been in this position for only about 48 hours, and I appreciate your candor with this committee during the course of this open hearing. Yes, ma'am. Um, until this point, what was your role in the FBI's investigation into the um, Russian hacking of the 2016 election? I've been the deputy director since February of 2016, so I've had an oversight role over um, all of our FBI operational activity to include that, that in investigation. And now that you're acting director, what will your role be in the investigation? Uh, very similar, a senior oversight role to um, understand what our folks are doing to make sure they have the resources they need and are getting the direction and the, and the guidance they need to go forward. Do you support the idea of a, a special prosecutor uh, taking over the investigation in terms of oversight of the investigation in addition to your role? Ma'am, that is a question for the Department of Justice, and it wouldn't be proper for me to comment on that. Uh, from your understanding, who at the Department of Justice is in charge of the investigation? Uh, the Deputy Attorney General, who serves as Acting Attorney General for uh, that investigation, he is in charge. And have you had conversations with him about the investigation since I you've have. been in this role? Yes, ma'am. And when uh, Director Comey was fired, my understanding is he was not present in his office. He was actually in California. So my question is, who was in charge of securing his files and devices um, when, that, when that information came down that he had been fired? Oh, that's our responsibility, ma'am. And are you confident that his files and his devices have been secured in a way that we can maintain whatever information or evidence he has in connection with the investigation? Yes, ma'am, I am. 
Uh, it's been widely resourced uh, or reported, and you've mentioned this, that uh, De Director Comey asked uh, Rosenstein for additional resources. And um, I understand that you're saying that you don't believe that you need any additional resources? For the Russia investigation, ma'am, I think we are adequately resourced. And will you commit to this committee that if you do need resources, that you will come to us, understanding that we would make every effort to get you what you need? I absolutely will. Has, uh, I understand that you've said that the White House, that you have not talked with the White House about the Russian investigation. Is that correct? That's correct. Have you talked with Jeff Sessions about the investigation? No, ma'am. Have you talked with anyone other than Rod Rosenstein at the Department of Justice about the investigation? I don't believe I have. Uh, not, um, you know, uh, not recently, obviously, not not in, not the, in the last forty-eight not in this hours. Position, no, ma'am. Okay. Uh, what protections have been put in place to assure that the good men and women of the FBI understand that they will not be fired if they aggressively pursue this investigation? Yes, ma'am. So we have a, a very active lines of communication with the team that's um, uh, that's working on this issue. They are uh, they have some. Uh, exemplary and, and uh, incredibly effective leaders that they work directly for, and I am confident that those um, that uh, they understand and are confident in their position moving forward on this investigation, as my investigators and analysts and professional s staff are in everything we do every day. And I agree with you. I have no question about uh, the commitment. Um, that the men and women of the FBI have to, to pursue their mission. But will you uh, commit to me that you will directly communicate in some way now that the, these occurrences have happened and, and, and Director Comey has been fired? Will you commit to me that given this changed circumstance, you will find a way to directly communicate with those men and women to assure them that they will not be fired simply for aggressively pursuing this investigation? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. And um, how do you believe we need to handle, to the extent that it exists, any crisis of confidence in the leadership of the FBI, given the firing of Director Comey? I don't believe there is a crisis of confidence in the leadership of the FBI. Okay. I suppose that's somewhat self-serving, and I apologize for that. <laughs> um, uh, you know, uh, it was completely within the president's authority to take the steps that he did. We all understand that. We expect that uh, he and the Justice Department will work to, uh, to find a suitable replacement and a, and a permanent director, and we look forward to supporting whoever that person is, whether they begin as an uh, interim uh, director or a permanently selected director. Um, this, this organization in its entirety uh, will be completely committed to helping that person get off to a great start and do what they need to do. And do you believe that there will be any um, pause in the investigation during this interim period where we have a number of people who are in acting positions of authority? No, ma'am. That is my job right now to ensure that the men and women who work for the FBI stay focused on the threats, stay focused on the issues that are of so much importance to this country, continue to protect the American people and uphold the Constitution. And I will ensure that that happens. I appreciate that. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Senator King. Uh, second round, five minutes each. Senator Wyden. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I want to go back to the question I asked you, um, Director Pomp Pompeo. And uh, I went out and reviewed the response that you gave to me. And, of course, what I'm concerned about is the Sally Yates warning to the White House that Michael Flynn could be blackmailed by the Russians. And you said you didn't have any firsthand indication of it. Did you have any indication, secondhand, any sense at all that the National Security Advisor might be vulnerable to blackmail by the Russians? That is a yes or no question. It's actually not a yes or no question, Senator. I can't answer yes or no. I regret that I'm unable to do so. Uh, you have to remember this is a counterintelligence investigation that was largely being conducted by the FBI and not by the CIA. We're a foreign intelligence organization, and uh, I'll add only this. I was not intending to be clever by using the term firsthand. I had no secondhand or thirdhand knowledge uh, of that conversation either. So with respect to the CIA, were there any discussions with General Flynn at all? Uh, 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 with respect to what, sir? He, he, he was for a period of time the National topics, Security Advisor. Topics that could have put at risk the security and the well-being of the American people. I mean, I'm just finding it very hard to swallow that you all had no discussions with the National Security Advisor. No, I, I spoke with the National Security Advisor. He was the National Security Advisor. I, he was present for the daily brief on many occasions, and we talked about all the topics we spoke to the President about. 
but nothing relating to matters that could have compromised the security of the United States. Uh, sir, I, I can't recall every conversation that I had with General Flynn during that time period. We're, we're going to ask some more about it in closed session this afternoon. Admiral Rogers, let me ask you about a technical question that I think is particularly troubling, and that is the SS-7 question and the technology threat. Last week, the Department of Homeland Security published a lengthy study about the impact on the U.S. government of mobile phone security flaws. The re report confirmed what I have been warning about for quite some time, which is the significance of cybersecurity vulnerabilities associated with the signaling system seven. The report says that the department believes, and I quote, that all U.S. <coughs> carriers are vulnerable to these exploits, resulting in risks to national security, the economy, and the federal government's ability to reliably execute national security functions. These vulnerabilities can be exploited by criminals, terrorists, and nation-state actors, and foreign intelligence organizations. Do you all share the concerns of the Department of Humans, uh, the uh, Homeland Security's Department about the severity of these vulnerabilities and what ought to be done right now to get the government and the private sector to be working together uh, more uh, clearly and in a coherent plan to deal with these monumental risks. These are risks yeah. that we are going to face with terrorists and hackers and threats and I think the Federal Communications Commission has been treading water on this, and I'd like to see what you want to do to really take charge of this and deal with what is an enormous vulnerability to the security of this country. Sure, I, I share the concern. It's a widely deployed technology in the mobile segment. Um, I share the concern. The Department of Homeland Security, in their role, kind of is the lead federal agency associated with cyber and support from the federal government to the private sector as overall responsibility here. We are trying to provide at the National Security Agency our expertise to help generate insights about the nature of the vulnerability, the nature of the problem. Um, partnering with DHS, talking to the private sector. There's a couple specific things from a technology standpoint that we're looking at in multiple forms that the government has created partnering with the private sector. I'm not smart, I apologize, about all of the specifics of the DHS effort. I can take that for, for the record if you'd like. All right. I just want to respond before we break to Senator Cotton's comments with respect to Section 702. Mr. Director, glad to see my tax reform partner back in, uh, in this role. You know, uh, Mr. Director, that I think it's critical the American people know how many innocent law-abiding Americans are being swept up in the program. The argument that producing an estimate of the number is in itself a violation of privacy is, I think, a far-fetched argument. It has been made for years. I and others who believe that we can have security and liberty, that they're not mutually exclusive, have always believed that this argument that you're going to be invading people's privacy doesn't add up. We have to have that number. Are we going to get it? Are we going to get it in time so we can have a debate that shows that those of us who understand there are threats coming from overseas, and we support the effort to deal with those threats as part of 702, that we are not going to have Americans' privacy rights indiscriminately swept up. We need that number. When will we get it? Uh, Senator, as you uh, recall, uh, during my confirmation hearing, uh, we had this discussion. I promised to you that uh, I would... Uh, if confirmed, and I was, uh, go out to uh, NSA, meet with Admiral Rogers, uh, try to uh, understand, better understand, uh, why it was so difficult to come to a specific number. Uh, I, I did go out to NSA. Uh, it was hosted by Admiral Rogers. Uh, we spent significant time talking about that. And I learned uh, the complexity of reaching that number. I think the, the statements that had been made by Senator Cotton uh, are very relevant statements as to that. Uh, uh, clearly, uh, what I have learned is that uh, a breach of privacy has to be made against American um, people have to be made in order to determine whether or not uh, 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 they've breached privacy. So it, it, there is an anomaly there. There, there. there are issues of duplication. I know that they, they we're underway um, uh, in terms of setting up a time with this committee 
I believe, uh, in June, uh, as early as June, uh, to address, uh, get into that issue, uh, and to address that and talk through uh, the complexity of how, why it's so difficult to say I'm, this is specifically when we can get you the, the number and what the number is. Uh, so I, I uh, believe I believe we are committed. We are committed to a special meeting with the committee to try to go through this this particular issue. But I cannot give you a date because uh, I. I, uh, an end number because uh, the, I understand the complexity of it now and why it's so difficult for Admiral Rogers uh, to, to say this specific number um, uh, is the number. I'm, I'm well over my time. The point really is privacy advocates and technologists say that it's possible to get the number. If they say it and the government is not saying it, something is really out of sync. You've got people who want to work with you. We must get on with this and to have a real debate about 702 that ensures that security and liberty are not mutually exclusive. We have to have that number. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator. Senator King, I understand you had a... Thank you, Senator. Uh, if this hearing had been held two weeks ago, we'd be spending the last two hours talking about North Korea. And uh, I think we ought to pay some attention to that. Uh, Director Pompeo and Director Cardillo, could you give us an update on the North Korea situation, the nature of the threat, whether some of the uh, pressure that we were feeling uh, two and three and four weeks ago has relieved? Is there anything going on that should uh, either concern or uh, make us feel better about that situation? Director Pompeo. Uh, Senator, I don't see anything that should make any of us feel any better about this threat. We have a threat from flashpoints uh, that something could spark and have a conventional war, right, wholly apart from the issues we talk about with ICBMs and nuclear. It's a well-armed adversary that our Department of Defense uh, works hard to make sure and mitigate against those risks remain. Uh, they, uh, the leader continues to uh, develop, test, uh, attempt to verify, not only in the launches that we see, many of which have failed, but learned from each one but continues to develop software that improves day by day. Uh, this threat is very real. We, we should not all focus simply on the ICBMs either. American interests are held at risk today by shorter range missiles in theater. Nor enormous American assets. Seoul is held spaces. at risk by artillery. Seoul is held at risk. We have enormous American interests uh, in and around the region in Seoul. So, uh, no, I wouldn't say that in spite of the fact that it has fallen out of the uh, headlines for the moment, that there's any decreased risk associated with the threat from Kim Jong-un. There were some discussions after, uh, uh, again, about two weeks ago, of entering into some kind of discussions with the North Koreans. Is anything, can you report anything on that front? Sir, there, there, are, there are none that I'm aware of uh, related to trying to talk uh, Kim Jong-un away from his nuclear missile program. Uh, we have taken action inside the agency. I've stood up a Korean mission center to draw the best minds, the most innovative, creative people from across uh, our agency, and I'm sure we'll have others join in from across the intelligence community uh, to try and focus this effort so that we can get back on our front foot with respect to foreign intelligence collection against the North Koreans and the capacity to impact what Kim Jong-un is actually doing. On that latter point, would you agree that the, the path to influence is through China? I think it's uh, among our most productive paths and one that I know the President's committed uh, to working as a Secretary Tillerson. Thank you very much. Admiral Sen Rogers, uh, Senator we had King, a, yes, I, yes, please. Just chime in. I was in yes. front of you in closed session a couple of weeks ago, giving you great detail about the threat you've just highlighted. What you'll hear this afternoon is just, an, you know, the continuation of what I was briefing a couple of weeks ago. So I would agree with the director that this is, this threat has not only been sustained, it's continued to grow. Because it's fallen out of the headlines doesn't mean it's not. That's deadly. correct. It's still our highest priority. It is, it is the highest priority, the, uh, one of the highest, if not the highest priority of the intelligence community at this time. A great deal of effort is being spent relative to how we can uh, even better assess the situation and, and provide all the relevant uh, intelligence to our policymakers. Thank you. Uh, two final questions. Uh, Admiral Rogers, we, uh, the reason I was late this morning, we had a very informative hearing in armed services on cyber mm. uh, with some w Jim Clapper and Admiral Stavridis and Admiral, uh, General Hayden. Uh, the, the upshot of that hearing was we still don't have a doctrine. We still don't have a policy. We still don't really fully understand. You would concur, I assume, that cyber is one of the most serious threats we face. Yes, sir. 
And do we need to have a policy and a deterrent policy and something further than what we have now, which is kind of an ad hoc response uh, uh, to events? Right. It tends to be a case-by-case -case basis. Yes, sir. I, I agree. And we spoke about that when I testified before the SASC last week, as a matter of fact. And uh, it, <laughs> Senator McCain said, Senator McCain said, what's the impediment? Why can't we get there? Is it, is it the structure of our government? We've got too many people thinking about this. What is it going to take to get us to the point of having a, a doctrine that will guide us in this incredibly important era? We, we are seeing the nature of warfare change before our eyes. Sir. I don't have any easy answer for you. My role in life, not speaking now as a director of NSA, but as the commander of the United States Cyber Command, is to be the operational commander. So I don't develop policy. I, I play a role on the doctrine side, trying to provide an operational perspective. Well, I hope from your position, though, you would be poking oh, yes, the sir. administration and everyone you can think of, because yes, uh, I do not want to go home to Maine and say, well, we talked a lot about this, but we didn't do anything. And when the electric system went down, uh, you know, we, we might have been able to prevent it. Yes, sir. Uh, Director Pompeo, final question. Uh, do you think the Russian activity in the 2016 election was a one-off? No, sir. This is a continuing threat, is it not? Yes, sir. And uh, things that they learned in this election, they're going to apply uh, in, in 2018, 2020, and beyond. Yes, sir, and I hope we learn from it as well, and we'll be able to more effectively defeat it. And I believe that's why the work of this committee and others is so important, because we've got to understand what they did, how they did it, so that we can deal with it in the future. Would you agree? Yes, Senator, I would. Thank you very much. Senator King, if I could just add to that. I think uh, ma making this as transferable, uh, transparent as possible uh, not only to our, our, our own public, uh, but uh, throughout uh, democratic nations that are facing this, this threat. The more we inform our people of what the Russians are trying to do and how they're trying to uh, impact uh, our thinking and our decisions relative to how we want to be governed and what kind of democratic institutions that we want to preserve, uh, the better. So uh, my hope is the Russians have overstepped here to the point where people will say uh, we absolutely have to do something about it, and we absolutely have to, to uh, um, prevent deterrent efforts in place as well as potentially offensive efforts. Well, I, I think your point about open hearings and, and education is incredibly important. You and I were in the Ukraine and Poland just about a year ago, and what they told us over there was that the def best defense, they can't shut down their TV networks, they can't turn off the Internet, the best defense is if the public knows what's happening and they say, oh, it's just the Russians again. And we have to reach that level of knowledge in, in this country. So I completely agree and hope that as much of our work as possible can be done in open here. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Senator King. Uh, gentlemen, thank you so much. Uh, thank you all for your service. Thank you to all the men and women of all 17 uh, agencies uh, for the incredible service they uh, provide to the people of the United States, keeping them safe, doing things that most people in America will never know nor be able to fully appreciate. Mr. McCabe, a special thank you for you to stepping up to the battlefield promotion and, uh, and uh, representing your agency uh, quite well here. Uh, this part of the hearing will be adjourned. And gentlemen, you have about an hour and six minutes, and we'll see you at the other room. Thank you. Meeting's adjourned. Just a bit of news in relation to this hearing. Politico reporting this afternoon. You may have noticed the chairman leaving the uh, hearing just a bit ago. Politico says that Deputy Attorney General Rod Rosenstein requesting to meet with the, uh, the Senate Intelligence Committee uh, chairman and ranking Democrat, Senators Burr and Warner. He arrived at the Intelligence Co Committee spaces, according to uh, Politico. Want to let you know, too, that coming up in about an hour, 1.30 Eastern, we'll be live over at the White House 
for the briefing with Deputy Press Secretary Sarah Huckabee Sanders, live right here, right here at uh, C-SPAN at 130 Eastern. We'll, e- we'll uh, re-air this hearing this evening uh, at 8 o'clock Eastern, so you can see it all there and also online at cspan.org. One more piece of news from the committee. The chairman, Senator Burr, yesterday issuing a subpoena to force former National Security Advisor Michael Flynn to turn over documents related to that panel's probe.